Welcome to Why Knowledge Matters. In this episode, Dr. Ken Fraser joins me and I'm very excited and he will discuss Afghanistan and the pull out of Western troops and of course the recent event. Welcome Dr. Ken Fraser. It's really great to have you back. Well, it's really great to be here. It's a great honor to be uh, able to contribute to these discussions, marvelous uh, activities you've been doing. Very pleased to be with you. Thank you so much. Let's just dive into it. What's happening in Afghanistan? Yes, Joe Biden uh, had in, he announced that it was going to be uh, they were going to be leaving in at the anniversary, the 20th anniversary of the uh, attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon in the U.S. So September the 11th, um, there was there had been a, a deal made with between the Taliban and the previous U.S. administration under Donald Trump, um, which had was quite detailed, uh, staged withdrawal that was going to be completed by May the 31st. So um, Joe Biden had a choice either to go ahead with that deal uh, or to, to tear it up and, and do something else. He, he could have basically done whatever he wanted, um, but he's chosen to just de delay the pullout by several months from May to September. and. Uh, they've gone ahead and done that. Now they've they've done what seems like a pretty smart uh, tactical move in that uh, they said it was going to be in September, but then most of them have already packed up and gone. They did it quite quickly, uh, which I can understand why they would do that because they wanted to get everybody out before they might come under attack from the resurgent Taliban who was was very predictable, I think, that the Taliban would take over. They themselves, the administration, had said that was would probably be the outcome. Uh, Joe Biden was more confident. He was putting a lot of stake in the uh, Afghan National Army, uh, the defence and security forces there to, to fight back, basically, to hold their ground against the uh, Taliban. And he seems to have been a little optimistic uh, about how the morale was in the Afghan national uh, forces. There are a number of things that might account for the for the fact that what seems to have happened is they've just dissolved and uh, gone back into the community, uh, rather like what guerrilla forces do. So it remains to be seen whether they uh, took any weapons or took any um, whether they're planning to come back and, and start. You, uh, producing a counter guerrilla force against the Taliban. That would be one possibility for the future, but that remains to be seen. There's some uh, criticism of those forces for, um, for doing that, for giving up their positions so easily when uh, I think Joe Biden himself was hoping they would, uh, hoping and expecting that they would put up more of a fight for it. Um, but there's some reasons why you could say that was, that was what they did. Sensibly, um, <laughs> there were a lot of them on the books, but whether there were an equal number on the ground uh, is another question. So now what's happened is the Taliban have swept through all the cities. Not, uh, I'm not sure if it's all the cities, but certainly um, many, most of the major urban centres, um, they've just taken city after city. There have been a few places where the uh, Afghan special forces have uh, held out, special operations forces have held out and have uh, made a stand against the Taliban coming back. But uh, sadly, they've been few and far between and, and probably pointless in the end. Um, they might not have known what was happening in the rest of the country, I suppose. So a lot of courage displayed by them, uh, sadly, would to know no result in the, in the long term. So far, it seems it's very difficult to know what's happening in the rest of the country. Um, uh, apart from Kabul, every, most of the vision and most of what we're seeing by uh, the Western press or the English-speaking um, media has been from Kabul. So it's very difficult to know what's happening in the rest of the country. But the Taliban have been making all the right noises about uh, women's rights, about general people's rights, 
about not they've they've said they won't be taking revenge on um, people who've worked with the Western forces there. You know whether that's whether they're just talking about that or or whether they actually genuinely intend to ha uh, have an attempt at reconciliation with those people. It just remains to be seen. We don't know whether they're sincere or not. What is your feeling about this? That you know maybe we just have to give them more credit to Taliban and maybe they will be very cautious and will be actually help rebuild Afghanistan that is struggling, you know, now for decades, you know, well, like, well more for decades, I think. Well, like half a century, really. Uh, yeah. They've been, um, the, the Russians invaded in 1978 or nine, um, and they've been pretty much constantly at war since then, which is, runs on to 40 years of constant war of one kind or another. Uh, war and occupation, you might say. So there's a kind of a little bit of a difference between war and occupation, um, which perhaps we can talk about a bit later. But as far as giving the Taliban credit, well, it just remains to be seen. The uh, original founder and leader of the Taliban, uh, Mullah Omar, um, was uh, he died of tuberculosis back in 2015. Uh, then they had another leader who was killed in a drone strike by the Americans in Pakistan, I believe. Uh, and now the current leader is, um, who knows? I mean, I personally don't know that much about it, about him. Um, but there's no particular reason to say they're not going to um, help, as you say, help to reestablish and rebuild the, the country after this these long decades of war. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do because people are, many people are traumatized by the things they've seen and done. Uh, the economy won't be going very well apart from the uh, heroin trade, although Afghanistan does have quite a lot of um, natural resources. So if they can attract investment, they might be able to uh, start to build up. As a general rule, new governments uh, new regimes, I should say, uh, the very first thing they're occupied with is to legitimise their own rule. What do they want to do? What they want is recognition uh, from the international community um, of states, and they also want recognition from their own community. They want the people there to accept the, their uh, rule. So that's something that might give us some hope they, because in order to um, you can you can make people bow to your rule by killing lots of them and, and torturing them and, and depriving them of the necessities of life and oppressing them one way or another um, that's one way it's a relatively unsustainable way really um, a better way is to provide them with the public goods that governments are uh, undertake to provide. Certainly under Islamic law, there's a responsibility on the government to look after the people, um, a, a strong one, and, the, and there's a, um, there are provisions for resistance of governments that don't do the, fulfil their duties in terms of looking after the people. Um, as I say, there doesn't appear to be much evidence. It's very difficult to know what's happening in the countryside, but they are saying they're not going to be punishing um, people who worked with the occupying forces or you know, translators, drivers, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who have been connected in one way or another with the occupation. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there is a potential there for a horrendous bloodbath, um, but at the moment it doesn't appear to be happening, but it's early days yet, so we really don't know. So to give them some credit, well, uh, we can't really give them any credit for something for things that haven't happened yet. Uh, remains to be seen. You would certainly have to credit them with a uh, canny and uh, and persistent strategy strategy that's involved uh, a long time of patient training and attracting support from other great powers, China and Pakistan. Well, it's, it's be wrong be a wrong impression to say that Pakistan supports the Taliban. Um, but Pakistan's a very fragmented um, state. There are different power centres there, um, and some of them have been, certainly been supporting the Taliban. Um, and what, they, yeah, go on. What do you think is the support, you know, within the broad society in Afghanistan, you know, for the Taliban? You know, it also seems to be hard to actually discern 
how broad the support is. You know, yeah. can you say about something about this? Well, again, it's extremely difficult to say because uh, while the occupation was there, the, many people in the countryside in particular were um, in a position where they would, the Americans or the occupying forces, including Australians, um, would, and, and including NATO forces, but mostly Americans, and they would come during the day and, and extract uh, promises and, and statements of, you know, try to build support with the people in the villages. Um, but then at night time, the Taliban would come along and they would declare their support for them during not the nights. And they had a terrible time of, you know, constantly on a knife edge with people pointing guns at them and uh, trying to, and, and they would sensibly would be just saying whatever they felt they needed to say at the time to stay alive. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, to gauge public opinion in those circumstances. Nobody no. goes around doing opinion polls in, when there's a, a war going on. So, but, I mean, surveys in a lot of the Muslim world come back with quite strong support for Sharia uh, and, and Islamic practices in terms of government. Um, but Islam doesn't have a very, as a general rule, doesn't have a very strong distinction between politics and religion. Um, they kind of go together. So, uh, that, and, and a lot of people express support, but they don't. But Sharia has a, it's a kind of loose, like any other um, foundational text. The the Hadith and the Quran have they can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, some people even the interpretation of them is contested because some people say uh, that you're not allowed to interpret them. Uh, those, they say it's the word of God or the word of the prophet and that you, you, you can't interpret it. You have to just take it at face value. Others say, well, no, there, there is this tradition of ishtahad, of uh, interpretation um, of the, uh, you know, the precepts that, under, uh, that Sharia runs on. And in fact, Sharia, depending on how you interpret it, mostly in the West, when you, mean, when you say Sharia, people say Sharia law. Well, and, and what they're really referring to is the very harsh punishments for criminal offences, including blasphemy and including adultery and things that we wouldn't normally in the West, in the democratic West, we probably wouldn't classify them as crimes at all. Um, but they'd be personal matters. Uh, and they have, it, they have what's called the hudud uh, punishments for like thieves get their hands cut off and uh, people can be executed for various crimes that that the English-speaking democracies would not consider to be crimes, so blasphemy, um, uh, homosexuality, other things, uh, that uh, dissent, you know. The, it's, but the point is, that it, it all uh, depends on how you interpret what Sharia is. Mm -hmm. Most people in the West, they say Sharia law, and what they mean is those harsh punishments. But Sharia is much more than that. Sharia is a whole way of life. It's a whole system of organising governments and populations. Um, and it, it can be variously interpreted and, and variously enforced. So uh, measuring, even if you were to be able to get in and, and take an opinion poll of the population of Afghanistan regarding Sharia, they, you might find them saying, yes, I support Sharia uh, being uh, as a system of government, but if that wouldn't actually tell you very much about what they really uh, would like to see. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of women, for example, who um, support uh, Sharia, uh, but they reject that they need to be wearing head coverings or, or certainly full body coverings. That's not mentioned um, in the Quran or the Haritha or the other law components of Sharia. It doesn't say women have to be covered up completely. It says that women is, and men should dress modestly, but yeah. you can interpret. Again, everything is open to interpretation. That is very interesting. Let's just go back quickly what you have said that, you know, the previous administration uh, had done a deal with the Taliban. And so you would also say that, you know, the Taliban didn't conquer in the sense Afghanistan, militarily speaking. In other words, yes. due to this deal, you know, it was quite clear that they will take over 
And therefore, the Afghanistan military just decided basically, you know, to, to step back and just let them pull into it because it was just so quickly and it was almost impossible. And do you think, given the military power of the Afghan um, government, if there would have been an actual clash between the two groups, would have had the Taliban any chance, militarily speaking, against the Afghan government? Well, you have to then come back to the question of morale, um, which is an is a key component of any uh, military operation or military culture. You can have all the weapons in the world and all the training and uh, all the money, everything you need to have, but if people haven't got the will to fight, if they don't, if they uh, are not on the side, you know, if they're not committed to the cause that they're fighting for, then why would they, you know, all the gear won't help in that case. Now, having said that, uh, and I know Joe Biden's been saying things about, you know, why should we protect the state that when their own armed forces are not willing to um, fight for their own existence? That it's a little bit uh, harsh. Like I, say, I see where he's coming from. Say, well, if they're not willing to fight for it, why would the US want to stay around for another several decades, possibly, if the people there themselves are not willing to fight for it? That's a little bit, uh, should be qualified at least, because many of those soldiers hadn't been paid for a long time. Many of the soldiers didn't even exist. There was a, on paper, there was uh, something over 300,000 um, personnel. Uh, like com combatants, um, but many of them didn't even exist. They were they, were, they call them ghost soldiers. So the up, higher up people were drawing their salaries, but they weren't paying any. They weren't actually recruiting people to do that. Um, similarly, with the equipment, they were given lots and lots of high tech, very good uh, equipment, good gear uh, by the Americans. But uh, again, uh, they, uh, it was being sold on the black market. So there was. So the corruption of the government uh, has, a, has a couple of effects. One effect is that you're not going to fight without ammunition. If all your ammunition has been sold on the black market, you, you can't fight, can you? Um, so I wouldn't like to say anything too definitive about the extent of that, but it certainly is a, a, a factor. But the other factor is if you're on the front line, no matter what sort of gear you've got, and, and then you discover that your president has uh, disappeared overseas and um, that the, the people you're supposed to, the government you're supposed to be fighting for is corrupt and obviously not having the, really the interests of the people in mind, but more their own interests in uh, making as much money out of being in government as they can. It's like the question becomes, well, why would you fight for a government that's not even trying to uh, look after the needs of the people? Whereas the Taliban are coming and saying they've got a very firm agenda. They know exactly what they're doing. They're predictable. They might, it, it may turn, it may, remains to be seen whether they'll be terribly harsh with public executions and harsh punishments and that sort of thing. If that happens, that'll probably turn the population off them. Uh, but there is a possibility, let's hope, that they've become more moderate um, in the year, in the intervening years since they were last in power. We, we can hope that, but I don't know what evidence there is. Um, but you can certainly see, you might say, well, if they're not about the national army, I mean to say, well, if they're not willing to fight for their own country, why would we be willing to fight for them? But then you might, but then the next question is, well, why would they be wanting to fight for a government that's, that's so corrupt and obviously doesn't have their interests at heart? So bottom line, you would say that the responsible bears as much the Afghan government as the Western government, in a sense. But, and this, I think it's an important question. I'm very curious what you think about this. Would you call this Afghanistan started 2001? Would you call it... Uh, Western policy disaster when you look at the very recent events? Uh, well, it's hard to escape that conclusion. Um, the recent, it's hard also to look at the recent events in isolation from the whole thing that's been unfolding over 20 years, as you say. 
they began specifically disavowing nation building or state building. Uh, the US, George W. Bush specifically said, we're not going to nation build. They didn't initially send an occupation force, mostly it was special forces, special operations forces and uh, air power that they used to, uh, to route the Taliban. And of course, Osama bin Laden, they are not Afghan. Uh, the uh, Al Qaeda are not Afghan, they're uh, Arabs, mostly, nearly all of them were from Saudi Arabia uh, and, and others from all over the Arab world. And they were sometimes resented by the people that they were among. They were saying, well, how, what are these Arabs doing in our country? Um, so they achieved their ends in terms of routing the uh, Al-Qaeda, even though they didn't capture Osama bin Laden until a long time later, 10 years later. Um, so I would certainly, and, and then they found themselves drawn in further and further into occupation of Afghanistan. And then by necessity, they found themselves having to support a government, which they were hoping that the government would take over responsibility uh, for the country and that they would be able to withdraw. This is an almost impossible thing to do. It's very difficult. The, the two um, times that it has worked have been with Japan and Germany after the Second World War. Well, they were completely shattered. They were under occupation. In some ways, they still are. They're still very large American forces in both of those countries. The Americans wrote a constitution for both of those, and it worked. Uh, over time. They spent an awful lot of money with the Marshall Plan, um, but they've spent more than that in Afghanistan, uh, but it hasn't worked there. So it's interesting to, to it would be an interesting project to examine the differences. Uh, is it a policy disaster? Well, it might be that you can say that the withdrawal has been a policy disaster, but I wouldn't say that. From a strictly American point of view, strictly from the US's point of view, it's, it's a good move. It's undoubtedly a good move. Why would they be wasting uh, huge amounts of money and, and their lives of their soldiers to uh, run this government on the, uh, prop up this government on the other side of the world that doesn't have any strategic interest for them. Uh, now, whether that's a good decision, for, it's a disaster for the people of Afghanistan is another question again. But, and so as far as a policy disaster for the US, the withdrawal doesn't look like, like that to me except possibly in terms of their credibility for future operations. But the initial invasion actually doesn't seem like a disaster either, but the problem was that they were drawn in to occupy occupation and to propping up a, a corrupt and unpopular government for many years. That's the disaster. The disaster had already happened. Nothing that Joe Biden was going to do would prevent what has had already happened in the past. Now, there's a, there are many arguments to be had uh, that they should have stayed there. They didn't have all that many people there. It, it, people did have rights. The uh, women were able to participate in public life. Girls were being educated. Uh, media was freer. You know, there was free speech and free media. There was music and dancing. Um, so you, you could say, well, it wasn't that expensive for the Americans. It had been in the past. But now to be going on with it, actually, they weren't spending all that much money uh, as compared to their overall military budget, perhaps. So the, there are arguments, there are valid, good arguments to say why well, they should not have withdrawn. Um, for, but, they, but they're arguments about what's good for Afghanistan. They're not arguments about what's good for the US. For the US itself on its own, it's undoubtedly the best move. Except, as I say, the problem, and, and you're about to ask me, I think, <laughs> um, the problem with, for the US is, is their international reputation. So next time they say we're going to intervene in some country or, uh, or they threaten to uh, do something to stop a genocide happening somewhere or some other horrendous disaster, uh, people are going to say, oh, yes, well, all they know now. All we have to do is wait them out. This is the, the great... Uh, thing about guerrilla war against occupations, um, insurgencies, is that they don't have to win, they just have to not lose. And uh, so you asked before about whether the Taliban has conquered uh, Afghanistan, and the answer has to be yes, even though there wasn't much fighting uh, involved, there, there was some, um, but just now. 
uh, but they were well prepared. They knew exactly what they were going to do when the Americans left. They, were, they planned to come in the north where most of the resistance to the Taliban is in the north. So they started there. Uh, they were deliberately attacking uh, two places at once often um, so that the Afghan forces didn't have enough of the special operations forces to be in two places at once. The Taliban did. It's very clever. So they, their strategy has been very effective. The, the um, old uh, The Art of War, written by Sun Tzu in China, uh, the Bible of strategists everywhere, uh, says that the greatest excellence of strategy is to win without fighting. And I think you can say uh, that that's, they've achieved that, that they've managed to manoeuvre themselves into a position where they didn't have to do all that much fighting. Not saying there was no fighting, there was, um, but mostly it was, it was pretty much a walkover. And that is the result of good strategy on their part, among other factors, but certainly they, they deserve credit for that. Um, they're not my favourite bunch of people, that's for sure. Uh, it remains to be seen whether they can redeem themselves and their reputation in the eyes of the international community, but they'd have to go a long way to do that because they had an absolutely horrendous reputation uh, before that. So, you know, to wrap up, <laughs> I, I could say you remain, you know, somewhat, you know, optimistic for the future, you know, given the recent events that seemed just crazy. Um, yeah. Well, it all happened um, very much faster than what the Americans were hoping it would. And uh, they reached Kabul much faster than the Americans were planning for. Not only the Americans, my own country, Australia's had to sort of mobilize emergency flights to get people out, which they were planning to do, but uh, it was much faster. Um, as far as optimism is concerned, uh, it's not so much that I'm optimistic as that I'm willing to keep an open mind about it. I, I don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, if they start, the eyes of the world will be on them, that's for sure. There are plenty of other regimes in the world who are pr uh, horrendous as far as their, uh, particularly their legal systems are concerned. In, in Saudi Arabia, there are regular public executions Women are not allowed to drive, or they might have only just recently been allowed to drive. They can't go out without a male member of the family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There are plenty of uh, other places which you would say are uh, harsh and oppressive regimes. Um, so optimism's a bit, I don't know that I'd say that I'm optimistic, but I would say that I'm willing to keep an open mind about it. But the Taliban would have to do a lot to, uh, to convince me or anybody else for that matter that they've been that they have changed fundamentally they're still talking about they're saying we'll respect women's rights as long as they conform with sharia that will you know they're they've allowed unicef uh, has negotiated with the taliban over quite some time uh, to be able to set up schools for girls um and th and that sort of thing so that they probably wouldn't have been able to negotiate that with when mullah omar was in charge um, so there are some signs, but again, it's just far too soon to say. Dr. Ken Fraser, it's been great to have you on the show. Thanks so much. It's a great honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Yannick. Dr. Ken Fraser. <laughs>